as Tom said, uh, I am a healthcare attorney. I'm ashamed of that. I didn't have a choice. Uh, my dad sold the cows. That's 100% true story. I'm from Idaho. Uh, so I went to college and got a degree in history, which was incredibly useful. So, I, I, yeah, you know, I knew a lot of stuff. So then I had a roommate from Wyoming. I'm a guy from Idaho. I've got a roommate from Wyoming. And we would go fly fishing all the time. It was awesome. And one day, he gets this like big vision quest idea that he's going to go to law school and change the world because he'd been wronged in some way. And we all know that the way to fix problems if you've been wronged is to go to law school. And he, he says, I'm going to go to law school. And I literally went to law school because my buddy, Josh Sears from Wyoming, was a great roommate and I liked him. I had no desire to go to law school. I just didn't want to lose my roommate. <laughs> Swear to God. So I go to law school, I get a degree. I'm like, well, this is great. I do some stuff. Uh, I did a bunch of criminal defense, which was insane. And then I fell into healthcare. And so I worked for a TPA for years. I'm not telling you this because it's interesting. I'm telling you this because hopefully in a minute when, well, more like in 45 minutes when I get to the content, um, you guys will kind of go, okay, good. I, you know, I see where he's been. I see where he's coming from. I'm not right. Maybe I've got some ideas or whatever, but I want you to know my background. So if I have one idea that's sort of useful, uh, maybe you see where it comes from. You guys hate me with the cameras, don't you? <laughs> Tom, said, Tom said, stay in front of the podium where it's light. So we're going to go back here. No, I'm sorry. The only reason I'm messing with you is because I didn't know this was recorded. And last year I spoke, and then like, I don't know, like a month later, my wife's like, look at this video of you on YouTube. And I was like, oh my god. Um, so anyway, time at a TPA, go to the FIA group, which has been amazing. Um, I think as those of you know that work with us, we are very fortunate that we work with tons of brokers and consultants, tons of TPAs. We work in the ASO space, a lot of stop loss, MGU. So we're very fortunate that we get to see a lot of things. And again, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that my idea is the best idea, but I'm going to tell you that I'm lucky and that my organization is lucky that we see a lot of things. So we can see some best practices, some mistakes, some things that are going on out there and maybe have some ideas on how to fix stuff. So today we are going to talk about not just plan docs, as, as Tom mentioned, but generally, you ready for this title? Gaps in Harmony. It's like a boy band. I came up with it. And then when I saw it in print, I was sort of like, that's terrible. Um, it really is. But what I'm talking about there is the idea of harmonizing, again, a terrible harmonizing all the documents that make a self-funded health plan run. So many of us get super caught up with the idea of a plan document, what needs to be in it to make it compliant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We tend to forget about all these other documents that impact the plan, impact the legalities, impact our liability, impact our benefits. So, Nothing earth shattering, but what I'd like to do today is talk to you about these different documents. They're overwhelming. Give you some examples of some of the gaps that might exist between a plan document and a stop loss policy. Huge disclaimer, we got everybody, all the stakeholders in this room. It's not a you did this or you did that. I'm just pointing out the different things we're doing together that we want to try to get together. Maybe a couple of best practices, ask me some questions, and maybe somebody takes one thing out of the room that they're going to be able to use. Okay, so with that, I do want to share the two most innovative cost containment techniques. Everyone knows FIA. We're really big in cost containment. So before we get into the plan doc world um, and the gaps in harmony world, two most innovative cost containment techniques. Number one, have your vet fill your prescriptions. True. I have a dog with congestive heart failure. You heard me reference my diabetic dog, also true. I run a geriatric canine ward. True. My dog with congestive heart failure actually just blew his knee out the other day, so now we're going to do that. Um, and true. Like, I, it's, I, I'm glad I make decent money. Um, but my dog with congestive heart failure, he has to take a cocktail of three pills in the morning, three pills at night, crush it up, put it with some milk. It's very exciting. And two of the pills he takes, you cannot get on 1-800-PET-MEDS. They're not canine meds at all. They're, they're human heart medications. I didn't know this. My vet kind of calls it in, kind of not. Here's the weird thing. 
did you know that if you just go to the pharmacy and sort of say like, it's for my dog, and they're like, oh, did the vet call it in? And I'm like, I don't know. They'll just fill it anyway? <laughs> At least my pharmacy does in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, I put on my FIA cost containment hat, and I'm like, man, this is a good idea. I'm gonna like write a white paper on uh, you know, how to defraud, no, that's no, not a good word, but how to, how to get cheap drugs by saying it's for your dog. I'm serious, I did it yesterday. Um, and the other innovative cost containment technique, this one is so simple and it's been around for a long time, stop going to the doctor. <laughs> like a good Idaho boy, I broke my foot last year, the long bone on the side. Like a good Idaho boy, I wore cowboy boots for a week, I didn't go to the doctor. Like a good Idaho boy, I went to light a fire in my backyard on a cold winter day. I went to break that piece of wood leaning against the, the, the bale of hay. And I ended up on the ground crying, and then I went to the doctor. So I learned my own lesson that, yeah, you know, you probably shouldn't avoid that. So now that we've taken as much time as we possibly can, let's get into the meat of it. That's us. Uh, there's a lot of friends in the room. I know so many of you, so you are familiar with who we are and what we do. I'll make it very fast for those uh, that don't. I'm not here to sell the fee group. Again, I just want you to know who we are so you know where I'm coming from. Oh, there's my title. That's our mission. I won't read it to you because everyone in the room can read, likely. Privately held firm in Boston, uh, about 20 years old. At the end of the day, everything we do functions to serve the self-funded health plan. All the stakeholders involved drive down costs, whether it's in terms of plan design, whether it's on the back end negotiating claims, whether it's our subrogation and recovery services. At the end of the day, it all, it might be a different service silo, but that's the driving factor, okay? Vision statement, pretty pictures. Yes, I'm wearing that exact suit right now. It's the only one I own, true story. That is where we are. Not we in this room, I, the FIA offices. And this is what we're gonna talk about. Number one, what are all the documents that make a cell phone and health plan run? I would assume if we just sat here in a safe environment, everyone, it's Vegas, it's safe, um, you know, what stays here happens, whatever. Um, you know, and we sat in this room, we had a drink or two to where we all felt honest and could start talking out loud. I'll bet you we could come up with all of them. You know, people get talking, start thinking, what are the documents that make a self help plan run? But what's interesting is, even though they seem super obvious, I'll bet you in my list, there's gonna be a couple that a handful of you didn't think of, that they impact a self funded health plan. I hope, if that's the only thing you get out of the time we spend together today, that was a good use of time, then you're suddenly gonna go, wow, I didn't realize that, that particular document needs to be looked at. Second, after we talk about the documents that make a self-funded health plan run, let's talk about misalignment, the harmony gaps, my horror stories. Again, a lot of them are gonna be things you're gonna go, yep, knew that, been there, done that. I may not tell you anything earth shattering, but the idea is let's talk about those things, then we can talk about how we fix them, and then at the end, that's exactly what we'll do, best practices and recommendations. So, hi, welcome to self-funding, employer. You've enjoyed your BUCA experience. Wasn't it nice? You paid a lot of money and you kind of had a policy and maybe you signed something. Now you get this. Let's have, let's have an honest showing of hands. Who here was born into self-funding? Who here came out an expert in self-funding? No one. So when you came into self-funding, whatever it was you were doing prior, whatever your career was prior, weren't you shocked? as you started to put it all together. I am a hardcore advocate for self-funding. I love it more than anything. I'm not just saying that. I'm passionate about it. So nothing I'm saying here is meant to knock self-funding, criticize, but let's be honest. That's a little overwhelming, right? I hope it is. Because if anybody looks at that list and is like, that seems incredibly normal and easy to me, Tim. Hooray, no way. I remember when I fell into the TPA world and you know, I'm working and they're like, hey, you wanna, you wanna run the plan doc team? And I'm like, what's a plan doc? And they're like, it's like the policy, but with a different title. And I'm like, that's cool. And then all these other things are happening and I start understanding how it all ties together. I was like, this is insanity. So number one, look at this list. I hope there's at least one thing on there, even though you've heard of all these documents, I hope there's at least one thing on there that you didn't really think about in terms of, oh, that impacts the self-funded plan, that impacts how it runs, that impacts the benefits, that could create a compliance issue. 
Yeah, this is what keeps Corey and I in business, all these documents. So let's go through them one at a time, and I promise we'll do it fast, because I know happy hour is coming up. This is a dangerous spot to be. Two most dangerous spots to speak are before happy hour, before cocktail hour on any given day, or the Friday morning 8 a.m. spot, right? When, they have the, when you have like the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday conference, and you're like the Friday 8 a.m. guy, you're like, that's awesome, because number one, half the people won't be there, and then the other half are like green, and maybe the speaker's green, I don't know. So why do I wake up screaming when I think about plan docs? This is not an exhaustive list. This is a very small list. Carve-outs that fly in the face of network contracts, this to me seems so simple, and I don't mean that in an insulting way for those of you who are like, well, that doesn't seem simple to me. I guess what I mean is I see this issue so much, I'm shocked that we're not addressing it better. And I'll be super clear, when I say we, I mean all of us. We're all in this together. We all create our little problems, let's solve them together. We as the vendors, we as the brokers consultants, we as the TPAs. Dialysis, that's the one that just always occurs to me. Cool, man, we're gonna carve out dialysis, we're gonna pay uh, dialysis at 200% of Medicare, right on. But you got a network contract and all your dialysis providers are in network. That's cool, we're an ERISA plan, man. ERISA supersedes state law. Yeah, except for contract is a state law issue and they're gonna sue you and win all day. No way, man, ERISA, cool. <laughs> Just keep paying me that hourly fee and I'll keep telling you, we're gonna lose. ERISA, ERISA, ERISA's my sister. I don't even know what that means, it rhymed. <laughs> I shouldn't think out loud. Is the plan document written before the plan year's even over? This, to me, when I got into the industry years ago and I started to see it year after year, I thought it was like an anomaly. I thought it was like, oh, it must be something we're doing wrong. And then, and then I was like, years later, I'm like, nope. And I'm not saying cyber thing was, it's just, isn't that weird? Isn't, doesn't anybody else think in our industry it's kind of weird how far we get into plan years that we all think it's sort of okay before plan docs are done, right? I don't know. I think we've all just sort of accepted it. I guess it seems to be working, so I won't complain about it too much. But in all reality, if we were to back up the coach a little bit, I think we could all agree that a best practice, spoiler alert, this will be at the end, a best practice would be what could we do better to try and get those plan docs done earlier? We all know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But it does cause a lot of problems. Gap reviews, this last bullet. This isn't going to just apply to your plan document and maybe a stop loss policy, as I've indicated here. A gap review can be your plan document bounced against really any of the other documents. Boop, there they are. A gap review is really taking two or three or four documents and lining them up and seeing where the gaps are. The stop loss example is a poignant one because it could have high dollar implications, incredibly high dollar implications. It could cost business. It could you know, undermine the solvency of a plan. It could cause a plan sponsor to give up self-funding that we care about and run back to the fully insured model. And I will say, my friends in the room that are stop loss and MGUs, that's not your fault. My friends in the room that are brokers and consultants helping with the doc, the vendor who's helping with the doc, the TPA who's helping with the doc and paying the claims, it's not their fault. We just all need to get together and say, look, the stop loss, they've got to write their policy the way they're going to write it, of course. Plan doc, we're going to write it the way we're going to write it, of course. And then let's take a break and put them together and be like, oh, the definition of experimental and investigational in the plan doc is, in, is completely different than the definition of experimental and investigational in the stop loss policy. Might be an issue, okay? And you guys know me, super casual conversation. If there's a question at any point, you don't have to wait till the end, we don't have to do a formal Q&A. If you're like, Tim, I, I think you're an idiot or whatever and you have a question, please do raise your hand because if there's something you're thinking, someone else might be thinking it and we can go down that road. I love this, this picture. I don't know why. Um, I have a weird sense of humor. So, isn't that awesome? Just like, just sit and take it in. It's a cute puffy dog. The words make no sense, but, it, but they rhyme. So, I was, I was like, I wanted to emphasize in this slide how the SBC was just insanity, in my opinion. 
I get the idea that it's a nice, hey man, in a, in a snapshot you can understand your plan. But the thing I've always laughed about is this idea that like the genesis of the SBC was, wow, this is confusing and there's so much paperwork. Let's make it less confusing by adding paperwork. And you're like, yeah, that's a great idea. So I go onto Google, because I was like, I'm gonna put a picture in this slide that uh, something that doesn't make sense. So I, I typed in, this makes no sense. And that was the first picture that came up. And I'm sitting in my office, and I just started laughing. And my assistant's like across the way. She's looking over to see if I'm drinking. She's like looking at her watch like, you know? But I don't know why, I just thought that was hilarious. I text my wife, and she's like, you're an idiot. My wife's, she's, she's got a flatter sense of humor than I do. Um, which is good. It means our kids have a chance. Um, but really, SBCs, right? So now we're moving on to the second document that I'm concerned about in my gaps in harmony, harmonizing our documents. I like that first line. Does my SBC line up with my SBD so I'm not SOL with the deal? We'll listen to the OPP and the LBC. <laughs> right? I love our industry. F just for your reference, those last two aren't industry. That's other people's property in the Long Beach crew. Is it LBC is Long Beach crew, I guess. I don't know. Um, but really, I remember when the SBC first came out, I was part of a team to start working on what are we cranking out here, what are we doing? And I ran into some people that literally thought you go onto the DOL website, DOL website, excuse me, print out the template example, and you send that out with all your health plans. I'm like, that's a great idea, because it's going to match all your health plans magically with unicorn dust. I was, I was like, what? And so, and so, to my second point, do the benefit examples in the SBC actually match your plan document? I mean, that's not rocket science, but so many people started jamming out these SBCs that didn't match the plan doc. Or, as I said five minutes ago, plan doc wasn't ready, it's just how we are. And so they are like, we gotta do something, and they haven't really figured out their benefits grid, so they sort of put an SBC together that they're like, yeah, this is pretty sure we're, how we're gonna do things. They send that out, then the plan doc is done four months later, and there's a pregnancy, and the person relied on the SBC. And again, let's go back to lawyers earning money. I'll take that case all day, every day that the person relied on the SBC. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's the conundrum of you got to get the SBC out ahead of time, right? So you're like, oh man, the timing issue. So this isn't rocket science, but again, I just want to emphasize here, let's think about our SBC, yet another document. Let's bounce it against our plan doc. And then let's go downstream, and there's probably a lot of other things we want to look at as well. All right. Ooh, PDM. I'll just talk about appeals on this one. And again, I want to emphasize, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, everyone in the room knows, you know, I'm, I, like, I'm not hardcore for this part of our industry and against that part of our industry. So when I say PBM, when I say stop last, I work with all of you and I'm a fan of all of you. Sometimes we just have gaps and it's not necessarily anybody's fault. Here's some stuff I've run into with PBM stuff. Um, and it's from personal experience. Uh, we do a lot of consulting work where we might assist with appeals on a plan, right? Hi, we're objective after it's gone through the payer. It's a difficult appeal, you send it to us. I know Corey's doing some of that stuff as well. I'm not here to sell anything, I just like to be factual. There's a lot of resources to do this type of stuff. I've run into this matter where I get an appeal and it should be handled by the PBM. The TPA didn't know that. There's a contract, the consultant didn't read it. I'm not bad enough in the consultants. Somebody didn't read it, bad example. I should have said somebody didn't read it. Um, I know, everyone's like, boo, red, lots of red collars. <laughs> but you know, you guys know what I mean. Somewhere along the line, there was this breakdown in communication in terms of scope of duty, who was supposed to do what. And so best intentions, I go, hey, PBM, is this yours? Is this, is, this a, is this in the medical plan or is this in the PBM? I don't know, in the plan doc, let's again, I'll, I'll keep beating this horse, maybe the plan doc's not done. And so we're on the phone and by the time we figure out who's supposed to actually handle this appeal and respond to it, we've blown a timeline. And then back to my underlying, underlying theme of lawyers making money, the person is, goes wee and sues the plan. Okay, so difficulty here, difficulty here. Look at these agreements, understand the scope, of duties, who's supposed to do what, how's it fit into the plan doc, how's it fit in with everything else, 
How does it fit in with your administrative services agreement? Okay? I'm gonna have a strategic Pepsi pause. Have I caused any questions? We good? God, that's terrible. Oh. <gasps> Come on. That is all you will see of your network agreement. You will sign it and not really sign it. I put the word D-A-M-N in a presentation that's going on YouTube. Um, what about this one, right? And again, I know we've got folks in the room. I, I'm a, I am a fan of networks. I'm not here to badmouth anybody, but guys, what's with the not sharing the contracts? Come on, can I, let's just say it. I'll say it out loud in front of a room full of people. What's with this idea that we have these proprietary contracts and we're not gonna share them with anybody, but yet everybody that plays under it is bound by it? That's tough. That's a little bit tough. That can be a hard pill to swallow at times. Inconsistencies between the benefit payment amount and the network agreement and the governing plan document? Have we seen that? Someone's seen that, please. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? A payment structure, a, a particular reimbursement structure that's spelled out in a network agreement that then doesn't make it into the plan causes a significant issue, perhaps an underpayment, upsets a provider, we've got some saber rattling, people are upset, and then the person goes, ha ha, Arissa, I'm not afraid of a lawsuit. Ah, now we're talking state law contract issues again, folks. Okay, totally different issue. Reference-based pricing. I love reference-based pricing. It's not for everyone. It's not always gonna work. When it's gonna work, I think it's wonderful. But here's something that's super interesting, and I find to be shocking that more people don't take this into account. People will get really excited about reference-based pricing, and they'll jam it into the plan, they'll put a little stuff in the plan document, and they ignore their network. Right? Now don't raise your hand, because you're like, wow, it's the first time I've heard of that. Raise your hand, come on. We've run into this, right? Somebody in the room? Help me out here. I don't want to feel alone on the stage. This guy's going to raise his hand just because I feel it. I just, just feel it. That's cold, man. Um, <laughs> you guys know what I mean. Reference-based pricing. The plan has the best intentions. The consultant has the best intentions. Maybe a vendor gets involved. We're kind of helping work it out for you. Recommended plan language. Plug it in there. Best practice plan language. We get things going, the pair's on board, the data's wonderful, so the claims are being repriced to a T, claims are going out being paid, and instead of like that kind of normal appeal letter that the provider might send that's like, hey, that's not cool, 200% of Medicare, that's a little short, guys, I'm upset, I think I should have been paid more. Instead, you get a letter from the Gibson firm or somebody that says, uh, hey, not only is this not cool, but here's a copy of the network contract that you're bound by that you've just completely ignored, and you're like, <laughs> he's right. He's completely right. Oops. Super common. And if those of you in the room are sort of going, Tim, I don't believe you, it, it, it actually is. It's shocking to me how common it is. And again, I'm gonna emphasize, I'm not saying anybody's the bad guy. The network, they've built their network, you want to lease it, you sign a contract, then you go over here and do reference-based pricing, and you've got a Ford and a Chevy, and they smash into each other. I guess, I don't even know what that means, but you guys know what I'm, right, okay. This one's really interesting too, at least for dorks like me. Inconsistent medical management, management criteria between the plan doc, the network agreement, what's medically necessary under the network agreement versus the stop loss policy versus your plan doc. Now what if drugs are involved? You get my point. I'm gonna do behind the back. It worked. <laughs> you guys see that? And this one I just kind of covered, okay? So I don't mean to belabor it, but it's such a wonderful example. Stop loss. Disconnect in the definition of medical necessity or the definition of experimental and investigational. Those are the two most common. I actually emailed, you know, I did these slides uh, you know, two weeks ago or something, but kind of earlier today after I landed, I just kind of wanted to confirm with some of our consulting team that do a ton of gap reviews, you know, where you take all these documents and analyze them and, 
uh, uh, write back a memo to tell you what we've found. And I said, guys, I won't tell you my thoughts, but you tell me the top gaps you find. These are the first two they listed. Super common, super common. A couple others that are really common are gonna be in the exclusions, okay? Hazardous activities, illegal acts. How many people love the illegal acts exclusion, right? Maybe it's, it's too tight in the plan doc or too loose versus what's in the stop loss policy. So if some claims are gonna squeak through and not get reimbursed, again, I'll emphasize nobody's right, nobody's wrong. They're two different definitions. These things need to be harmonized, okay? Here's the one out of everything we do today, I hope, again, I know I'm telling you some things that you're like, yeah, I've thought about that, maybe not to the degree that you have, Tim, because you're clearly a dork, but um, I've thought about these. Here's the one that I hope, I'm shaking you up a little bit in terms of, I'm hoping a lot of people in the room actually haven't thought about this, so maybe I'm bringing this to the table for some of you for the first time. What about the employee-employer handbook? Yeah, eligibility issues. This has been bubbling up a lot in the last year, year and a half, probably before, but I'd say from where I'm sitting and the work that I do, we've really seen it in the last year and a half. And I'll emphasize what ends up happening is it comes through to the stop loss layer, and I'll emphasize that a, a denial, if they've got language in there that says, look, if you're not actively at work, full time, whatever words we're using, and then you go back to the employee employer handbook and it talks about that, hey, if you, uh, these are the leaves of absence we have outside of FMLA and this and that, it doesn't match up with the eligibility criteria in the plan doc, the person's probably not on the plan. You guys see where I'm going with that one? A lot of people forget about the handbook, okay? I'm not trying to throw out some hand grenade, cause a problem. I'm trying to align all our interests. I think every stakeholder in our industry wants to see this stuff lined up, okay? So start thinking about that one. Again, of all, of all the stuff I've rambled about, my picture of the fuzzy dog, whatever it was, I think, I think this one's pretty, pretty key. I, I think I can gamble and say that a lot of folks in the room don't take this into their consideration when they're trying to line up all their documents and, and uh, harmonize the governing docs, okay? The ASA. So now I'm jumping into Tom and Marsh's world. Generous host who has asked me to be here. One of the most important documents to a payer is the administrative services agreement, right? They're trying to put a contract together so that they know what they're supposed to do, so that the folks in the room, whether they're an employer plan sponsor, a broker, a consultant, a vendor that's helping you know, provide a service to that plan, everyone can understand roles and responsibilities, often forgotten. I don't mean forgotten, I guess what I should say is sort of we have a template ASA and uh, we've been using it for years and it's going pretty good, but we kind of changed vendors somewhere along the way, made a few changes, changed some stuff we're doing in our plan doc. Maybe we're doing a new fiduciary thing or we're doing this, or we're doing that. Make sure our ASA lines up. Who done what? Scope of responsibilities. What's the plan's responsibility? Where does it sit? This vendor, that vendor, right? This is stuff that makes people, makes their hair fall out. This is like auditor stuff. This is accounting stuff. This is lawyer stuff. This is the things that make you go blind, but somebody's gotta do it, okay? All right, we talked about employer employee handbook. Please, if you take one thing away from our time together today, this is one that's very important to me because I've seen it so much again in about the last year and a half. It's out there, it's important. Let's be thinking about it. The idea of a gap review where you take a plan doc and a stop loss policy and try and make sure they're, they're aligned, that's not necessarily new. I definitely think our industry hasn't done as good of a job as they could have for years, but that concept's not new. People have been trying to do that for a long time. I do think this is fairly new. Maybe not to everybody, but based on what I'm seeing, I don't think people have been thinking about it much until now, okay? So please think about it. Do, 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 do. Oh. Ugh. Right? Plan amendments, my favorite thing in the world. Let me just put, let me just, just restate your documents. Let's just do it. Get rid of those 20 amendments that are attached. So what I'm trying to get at here is just another example of our trail of paperwork. Our trail of paperwork. 
as we try to take all these different contracts, these different policies, and align them, the last thing we need is more documents. I would suggest that a best practice is maybe it's every three years, restate. If I could be so bold as to say every two years, if you need to. If you don't, don't. Notifications, I'm gonna skip that. I don't wanna talk about notifications. Ugh. Vendor contracts, this is super important. So now, that, now we're in my world. So now I get to beat up on myself a little bit, so to speak. We have a lot of different vendors like the FIA group. We have some wonderful vendors at this event who come in and do various things to help a plan run, right? What about those contracts? I'm not here to shame anyone into bringing their contracts into the light of day. That's business decisions, relationships, that's not what I'm here to say. What I'm here to say is we have a plan sponsor that we all work for. We have one plan sponsor that we all work for in my little case example here. And we have all these contracts revolving around this little planet. Let's somehow get together and make sure we understand them. We're, we all have the same interest. I run into this a lot and it's, I, I, I definitely think it's 99% of the time completely unintentional. I do believe our industry works very hard to have all boats rise. I really do. I, I, I love this industry. And I think we all are very passionate about seeing it succeed. So I really do think it's 99% of the time unintentional. But I've had cases where maybe it's a service that the FIA group provides and that another vendor provides and that this group is paying for and has been paying for for two or three years before someone goes, man, they've been paying all this money for duplicative services. And it's sort of like, oh. Okay, so sorry, I didn't mean like shame anybody as we're getting ready to have vodka tonics or anything, but um, right? You guys get what I'm saying though. Like let's, let's get together. We're all in this together. We don't need to compete and hate each other or whatever as vendors especially. Let's, let's figure out what our scopes are. Let's figure out what our contracts say and how they line up. Let me do this. Let's see where we are, how close we are to your, oh, God. Let's see what my texts say. Soccer practice is going good. Okay. That's good because I'm the coach and I'm not there. <laughs> True story. Best practices. A lot of this stuff is very self-explanatory, but I'm not gonna apologize for that because part of my job is to remind you and bring you things that maybe you think about once a year but you uh, maybe like to forget about or haven't thought about because it's not super interesting. So my first one, of course, is a joke. What's our best solution here? Just forget this whole thing. Everyone go back. Hooray. No, don't do that. Engage experts, this is not self-serving, this is not, hi, come hire me, this is just somebody. There's a lot of people that do this. Of course we do it, but I'm not here to say come to me. Someone, someone. Cyprus does a wonderful job. You couldn't have a better payer. I'm not just saying that because I like to go to hockey games with Tom. I do, but truly, no I do. Like I, I, I have nothing but respect for Cyprus. Wonderful organization that assists in this exact thing. You consultants in the room. Tedious, it is terrible work. But this is something that differentiates you, make it part of your model. Vendors, we do it, somebody. Let's start these gap reviews. Let's start taking these documents and banging them together, figure out where the gaps are. You can't always fix them. That's the other thing, let me manage expectations. Part of this, part of this job, part of this chore is to just let everyone know Hey, plan sponsor, there may be a coverage gap in this one-off situation if this were to hit stop loss. I don't know that we can do anything about it. Nobody's right or wrong, it's just sort of the way your plan is. FYI, great, thank you for letting me know. Appreciate it, right? Every plan sponsor should have a sophisticated business owner. I'm not talking about doing a gap review. I went to a finalist presentation um, with a pair that we work with where they just kind of wanted to have their other vendors come in and just be part of it. And I was super stoked because in the middle of it, this uh, senior VP CFO from the plan sponsor, they're coming off a fully insured platform where they've been for like 20 years. This, this is crazy, you guys ready for this? Not only were they coming self-insured, which a lot of people do, but they were like, never done it before, we're going full RBP year one. I'm like, oh, what could go wrong? This will be wonderful, woo! But 
You know, so I'm sitting there like, hmm. Um, what they said next actually made me go, number one, isn't this an amazing idea for this particular group, but for everyone? This CFO says to me, we've already budgeted, we're searching for a full-time professional, not backfill, new position in our HR office that's gonna do nothing but become an expert in self-funding, reference-based pricing, be hip to hip with our consultant, go visit the TPA, this, that. And I was like, oh my God, oh. I like went and I didn't kiss him, I almost did. But I was like, that is awesome. So many of us talk about consumerism and ownership and whose job is this, and we can only do what we can do, but if we could get these plans to have that person, I know it's a pipe dream, but how cool would that be, right? Just as an example of something crazy. I'm running out of time, so if my slides, if my slides, if my slides haven't been shared, please, however that works, of course, I want you to have them. There might be one or two things, as I always say, anytime we spend time together, if there's just one thing you take out of it that you think about that can improve your business, improve your groups, get more people doing this, okay? Take that, do it, read these, okay? And I think with that, since we are buttoned up on time, I know it's so dangerous when you're in happy hour. I'll leave it there. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you for putting up with my rantings, my picture of my fuzzy dog. I appreciate you guys very much. Tom, uh, I'm a huge fan of Cypress. You guys couldn't be in better hands, so thank you guys for your time.